I V M. Hello and welcome to the Ganatantra podcast. I am Sariyu Natarajan and I am Alok Prasanna Kumar. And in this week's episode, we are joined by Srinath Raghavan. By way of quick introduction, Srinath is Professor of International Relations and History at Ashoka University. He previously taught at King's College London and worked at Center for Policy Research New Delhi. Srinath is the author of several books and his most recent one is The Most Dangerous Place: A History of the United States in South Asia. Raghavan has served as a member of the National Security Advisory Board. Prior to entering academia, he has spent 6 years as an infantry officer in the Indian Army. Welcome Srinath. Welcome Srinath. Good to be here. So let's uh, start off by what we want to talk about on this uh, particular episode and which is you know as part of our series on institutions of India we hope in this episode to talk about the army itself the Indian army and when we mean the Indian army we mean the armed forces in general um and to sort of try and go in depth into this idea that the Indian armed forces are apolitical what does apolitical mean and is that is that itself not a political position So we want to sort of um, go try try in the course of the next forty forty five minutes discuss that, but let's start for our viewers by talking about how the Indian Army is structured, in terms of how are people recruited into it, uh, who does it report to, and what is the organization's basic organization structure like. So part of the interesting thing about the Indian defense setup as a whole uh, is really this kind of peculiar organizational structure that we have, you know. So the Ministry of Defence is the main ministry which deals with these things in the government of India and you have the three armed forces but unlike many other countries including many other democracies the three service headquarters are not formally a part of the ministry of defence so they are somewhat separate okay and their uh, you know formal status has evolved over a period of time um, right. but but they are not integrated with the ministry of defence hmm. but the three services themselves control the army the navy and the air force okay. the service chiefs are responsible for raising equipping training preparing leading their uh, forces so they are uh, commanders in chief also of the services themselves and at this point of time there is a lot of discussion about whether we need to have a single point military advisor to the raksha mantri uh, who is a defense minister and that post is likely to be called a chief of defense staff prime minister modi announced uh, from the red fort this independence day 15th of august that uh, such a post will be created i believe uh, even as we are speaking discussions are underway about what exactly would be the nature of this office mm. so that will mean that the current setup will get modified a little bit so we'll have to wait and see how the structure will evolve yeah and all that, that's right at the top level but um, also in terms of the recruitment of the average person into the indian army under the indian air forces how does that generally take place well i think it's easier if we just focused on the army because okay. you know the air force and the navy have somewhat different recruiting structures even within the army uh, you know the recruitment patterns tend to be different so for instance if you take the case of the infantry which is part of the largest sort of fighting arm within the armed forces a lot of the infantry regiments typically tend to recruit from specific regions and specific communities and castes right so in a sense this is a legacy that we have had from the colonial indian army uh, now you know in the post independence period uh, this did undergo some changes we can talk about it later but the structure still remains of uh, you know recruiting from certain regions from certain communities from certain castes now of course there are other regiments and other parts of the indian army which uh, have mixed sort of composition so they do not recruit only from some specific just to give you an example right so my regiment in the indian army was the rajputana rifles uh, rajputana rifles is an infantry regiment and my battalion like most battalions in our uh, this thing would be made of what we call as four companies so you know a battalion of about say uh, 1000 men is divided into four companies of 200 each and now the each of the companies would be recruited from one particular caste right so or community uh, in 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 the case of my regiment two companies used to be recruited uh, composed and idea of jats and two companies of rajputs now the jats would be recruited from uh, haryana from western uttar pradesh from rajasthan rajputs would be recruited again from rajasthan from madhya pradesh from eastern uttar pradesh other parts of north india where you have the rajput community so recruitment happens in a very regionally focused way uh, 
right? So, uh, and as I said, that is not necessarily true of the army as a whole because there are other communities which are, and you know, there are regiments which are mixed class composition, so they don't have this kind of focus. But broadly, I think it's still fair to say that the recruitment of the Indian Army still happens broadly on region, community, caste remains the sort of matrix within which a lot of this operates. And I suppose that is something that has been pushed back against because there has been litigation in the past in the Supreme Court and elsewhere saying that this should be put an end to and this doesn't uh, necessarily lead for towards a kind of integrated armed force needed for a modern, secular, democratic nation. Uh, but how does the army justify this? And is there like a sense that maybe this was the way things were done, but perhaps we need to start moving in a different direction? Again, only on the army, because as you said, the Air Force and the uh, Navy have a different approach. And on this. one of the imaginations around the idea of independence in the army is the composition. And in what way does the way in which the recruitment process itself unfolds build into the idea of the army as an independent or apolitical entity? Okay. So let's take the first part of the question, right, which is to say that why do we have this structure? It's partly historical, uh, because when the British came to India, they initially under the East India Company had separate presidency armies. These armies were subsequently once the East India Company gave way to the British Raj, became one united, sort of unified Indian army. But particularly after the, you know, the rebellion of 1857, there was a concerted move towards making sure that the loyalty of the army was cemented and the way that the Raj believed that they could cement the loyalty of the armed forces to themselves because was by effectively getting a set of ethnic minority communities okay. to have disproportionate representation within the armed forces. Now, that is a very standard imperial practice. You know, it's not just about India, but it's there. And then there were forms of colonial knowledge which abetted this, right? So there was this whole idea that there are some communities in India which are somehow more suited towards military activity, they were termed as the martial communities. Now, that's a classic sort of what historians would call orientalist knowledge, right? So, uh, you create this kind of an, a trope about some people having certain kinds of immutable traits. And anyway, so, mm -hmm. so there is expediency, but there is also ideology, which together gives you an armed force, which is predominantly drawn from the martial communities. If I were to sort of enumerate them, it would be, you know, starting from North, Northwest India, the, you know, Punjab was the main sort of place. So you had both the Sikhs, the Jat Sikhs in Punjab and the Punjabi Muslims or the Punjabi Muslims. You had Pashtuns or Pathans from the Northwest Frontier Province. You had uh, Rajputs, Dogras, Marathas from North and Western India. And of course, you had Gurkhas who were from Nepal, right? I mean, but they had gave another added level of loyalty because mm. they were much more mercenary in, in their sort of uh, recruitment and so on. Now, the by the time you come to independence, the Second World War puts a lot of pressure on the structure of the Indian Army because the Indian Army goes from being about just about 200,000 in the year 1939 when the war begins. And when the war finishes in 1945, the Indian Army is about two and a half million men in arms. Mm -hmm. Now, for that kind of dramatic expansion of the army to happen, you could not hold on to the older martial rate structures because those communities simply did not have enough eligible men to come forward so to, right? So you had to widen out under the compulsion of circumstances. The Indian Army had to expand. Uh, that expansion actually has an interesting dynamic to it, uh, just to give you a, a flavor of what is happening. They had to look well beyond the sort of dominant caste communities, the martial races, uh, to communities which are at the margins, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, Jat Sikhs, when you're running up against the limits of them, then you go to the other Dalit Sikh communities and you create a separate regiment for them. Uh, similarly, you know, other groups on the margins of caste Hindu society were bought in. Mm. Uh, Southern India became a very important part, right? I mean, so Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, mm. Kerala, all of these gave a lot many more people. In fact, Southern Indian representation in the Indian Army as a whole rises. But what does not change, however, is the character of the fighting units, which still remains heavily dominated by the martial communities. And as I said, even after independence, you still have that, right? Now, post-independence, there were these debates about saying, you know, does this structure really work for mm -hmm. the Indian Army and so on? So, but partly there is a weight of history. But I think there is another kind of functional logic to it as well, which is to say that, you know, a lot of studies about generation of combat power. And, you know, if you ask this question, why do people fight? Why should anybody fight? You're likely to get killed, right? Mm -hmm. What is the incentive there? And, and one of the things which comes out of many of those kinds of sociological studies, especially around the Second World War period, is the importance of the small unit to which you owe your loyalties, right? And having this kind of highly sort of community-based recruitment which comes from specific regions means that people within a subunit 
usually come from nearby villages they have ethnic relationships uh, kinship you know there, there are sort of geographic familial ties mm. all of which uh, in some ways is seen as making for a better more cohesive fighting unit which is the reason the army does so so the indian army you know in fact threw overboard quite uh, you know explicitly the notion of martial races after independence right. but held on to these structures now justified in this functional kind of a logic right mm-hmm. and to answer your question sorry which is about you know when we are thinking about how what this means for this thing so the recruitment of the indian army is broadly something that is left to the armed forces themselves as i said the raising of the armed forces is a function which is uh, rests with them now this does not mean that the government has not from time to time sort of indicated that you know the bases of recruitment have to be uh, expanded for instance one of the regiments which uh, was created immediately after india became independent is uh, known as the brigade of guards the brigade of guards is a mixed class uh, regiment right i mean so so there is a let's say uh, similarly to give you another example after the blue star operation of 1984 and the assassination of uh, prime minister indira gandhi you know there was a move towards again creating mixed class regiments because some of the sikh regiments uh, at that point of time you know one of them had battalions had mutinied there mm-hmm. were other kinds of problems so there was an experiment to try and see if we could integrate these things more simply to make sure that you know there's not like one community which you know uh, is, is whose sentiments are dominant and so on so there have been these extraneous kind of pressures directives but nevertheless the instrument of giving effect to those things still remains the armed forces themselves so they themselves do all of that stuff yeah and that sort of brings us to i think everybody's favorite question these days and you also hinted at the history of this we have seen that my and you know discussion about the indian army we talked about the indian army under the british rule this one same institution which has been inherited by two and now three countries has had three very different uh, trajectories in the context of india we have seen that by and large the army's role in formal governance let's say let's me put it that way is limited whereas in pakistan we see and even now we see that its role in governance is much greater there have been military governments in both pakistan and bangladesh there have been repeated military coups in both pakistan and bangladesh but there has never been a remote suggestion not withstanding some slightly uh, dubious reporting but there has never been some there's never been a suggestion in india that at any point of time the army should or can take over and uh, steven wilkinson's book does a pretty good job of describing but i thought we could go into some uh, i mean there is the legal mechanisms to ensure it but i think also it's important to discuss perhaps some of the more cultural or some of the softer reasons why this doesn't happen you know so steven's argument in his book is that um, by ensuring a certain degree of ethnic balancing within the indian army by these kinds of changes which happened yeah. post independence you managed to create a certain kind of a balanced structure whereas pakistan because the pakistani army was dominated by two communities the punjabi yeah. muslims and the pashtuns and yeah. punjab is also you know the strongest agrarian province it's the largest one it becomes very important hmm. in the sort of politics of pakistan after its creation so the the military bureaucratic nexus is effectively if you have to put a geographic location to it the center of gravity was punjab right okay. so uh, in that sense pakistan could never fix the ethnic hmm. imbalance story it in, in fact got much worse because you know when they were hived off from a larger army they become proportionately much bigger these two communities right. within that particular domain now that is one explanation but i think there are other to my mind uh, equally if not more important explanations mm. uh, the first i would say is actually the nature of the states itself which as it came into being uh, post 1947 right mm. so if you take the example of india mm. now india not only inherited much of the administrative structure of the british raj mm-hmm. uh, with all its kind of machinery mm-hmm. but also had a party in power the congress party mm. which had a highly ramified administrative structure going right down to the villages and right up to the top right now the the kind of political and sort of geographic presence that the congress party had gave the state a certain kind of stability beyond just the administrative structures right now you contrast that with pakistan now in pakistan you know it's it's one of the ironies of creation of pakistan of course is that the pakistan movement itself which is a movement to create pakistan is actually strongest in places like uttar pradesh the what used to be known as the united provinces and the muslim league itself had close to no presence in most of the parts of pakistan which actually ended up becoming pakistan in punjab there was a union uh, is coalition government in sindh there was a minority government northwest frontier province there was a pa- congress government right? right and in east bengal there mm-hmm. was actually a 
Muslim League was a junior partner in the coalition. Yes. So they never had that kind of presence administratively. No political <coughs> entrenchment. No political entrenchment, right? So no political as a result, uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah so, and others had to rely on the military and the bureaucracy hmm. to compensate for the weaknesses of the organizational hmm. lack itself. So, hmm. right, so that's one thing. The second thing is something related, which is that I think in the Indian case, there had been debates going back to the 1920s about saying that we need to have much stronger civilian control over the military. So right. the idea of civilian control of the military actually is not a gift of the British. Hmm. It is not something we inherited from the British, right? Actually, it was totally the other way around. Yeah. If you think of the administrative structures uh, during the British Raj, the military member of the Viceroy's Executive Council, who is effectively a defense minister, was by definition also the commander-in-chief of the Indian Army. Right, right. right? That yeah. is not true. Hmm. Uh, so so uh, things like the Motilal Nehru report uh, of 1927 make an explicit demand for a civilian defense minister. Now, hmm. that's one of the first things that the Congress government does even before independence. When the provisional government is formed in September 1947, the first thing they do is to get a civilian defense minister, Sardar Baldev Singh, and, you know, they bifurcate those responsibilities, right? So they try and create alternative structures of civilian control over the military, hmm. which is there right from the very beginning. And because of the Congress party's entrenchment, they are able to actually give practical effect to it. Hmm. Now, Jinnah was also one of the greatest advocates of these things in the 1920s yeah. and in the interwar period, right? I mean, in fact, in the roundtable conference, uh, yeah, which yeah. happens in the 1930s, he speaks in some of the sort of military kind of subgroups and stuff. Uh, he was actually quite clued up. But the reality was that he needed the military and the bureaucracy simply because the Muslim League had no organizational heft and they had no resources. The state was much smaller. So I think those kinds of, you know, what you might call as um, historical sort of institutional legacies, which, you know, which, which you had very different in starting points, really, of the two states, I think go a much further distance in explaining why these things happen. And there's also, I think, a certain level of um, experience post-independence where I do remember there are certain instances when uh, I think Nehru comes down very heavily on, I think it was Field Marshal yeah. Karyapa who tries to comment on some public, uh, uh, on some matter in the in public opinion and says, you have no business yeah, commenting on it. I don't care how you were shifted away to Australia to sort of... Uh, do it yeah, away. well, I mean, I, I'm not so sure whether it's hmm. it's it's a clear-cut case that he was shifted away to Australia because uh, this thing, but, but the reality was that the Indian leadership made it quite clear hmm. that political leadership, that we did not want the military to be talking about other things. Hmm. And in as much as the military had this kind of British ethos that, listen, we should be staying beyond, you know, we should be apolitical in that sense, um, you know, it, it kind of dovetailed. But I think the, the reality was that the balance of power between the civilian political and the military side was quite heavily tilted towards the civilian side right. at the time of independence in India. But then that's changed in some ways, at least with, you know, matters of internal security in terms of the whole idea of... Um, the army being having the independence in terms of operations mm. and th that balance is something that has been delineated over the course of the last 50 years in some senses yes um, and you know you're absolutely right which is that once you bring the indian army and deploy them for internal security duties you're you always run the risk of blurring the lines between what is a sort of military operational work and the work of a civilian administration, right? Mm. So those kinds of lines are difficult to maintain once you come there. Once you also bring in laws like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, then right, then there are sort of other kinds of zones of empowerment and exception which are being created in legal sense for the armed forces themselves. So those things uh, do matter. But I think equally, there were external shocks, so to speak, right? I mean, I think the defeat against China did a lot to dent the prestige of Jawaharlal Nehru and the Congress Party and uh, in, in, in its dealings on military affairs, right? And then that kind of led to a certain degree of, you know, hands-off approach by successive prime ministers thereafter, you know. Uh, so the, the, the broad kind of division of labor in, in the post-1962 period really is that all matters of policy and politics are something that the armed forces will keep away from. Hmm. And as far as their own operational story is concerned, the politicians and the bureaucrats will try and not involve, which also is the reason why the, uh, you know, the peculiar sort of administrative structure that I spoke about right at the beginning, which is of a lack of integration between the services and the Ministry of Defense was never bridged because it was felt that in some ways it's better that you stay out of each other's domains. Yeah. But the problem is that, you know, what counts as the operational domain is not exactly ever apolitical, right? I mean, if, if you start with the Clausewitzian dictum that war is a continuation of politics, then politics is 
down all the way down the chain, right? I mean, you can't sort of say that politics stops here or that actions which are taken in purely operational realm do not have political consequences. So, so those lines do tend to get blurred. But frankly, that's not a problem just for the Indian Army. I think that's a universal problem of civil-military relations. All armies find various kinds of institutional uh, equilibria with which you deal with those problems. And I think three examples, and correct me if I'm wrong here, which sort of illustrate what you just said, is I suppose one when Lal Bahadur Shastri decided in 1965 that we're going to cross the border against Pakistan, uh, possibly 1971 when Indira Gandhi sort of held back on uh, Manek Shah's advice that we can't, we're not ready for this, right? And, and of course, she sort of deferred to the operational concern and also in the Kargil war when Vajpayee said we're not going to cross, we are not going to cross the line of control. So, in a sense, and what you sort of say, these were fairly political calls. These were not simply that I will defer it to your judgment militarily, but I also realize that there are consequences pol- politically and internationally Actually. that I, as the you know uh, civilian government, have to weigh uh, before I take these calls. And of course, also when choosing to deploy the army to address this internal security, these, those are all very straightforward calls that you know you're saying, okay, look, you know, I, I need you to do this, uh, and I, it may, may not be something that you want to. I think we've seen this back and forth go on in the context of uh, operations against Maoists uh, about uh, how much to involve the army, how much not to involve, and finally the CRPF. But so it sort of brings me to the other point that it's, it's raised often enough that there is, apart from the Indian army, which we've just been discussing, there is a parallel paramilitary force which works alongside the army. And in some instances, it is used to say, see, this is how the central government balances out, you know, any military power that the army may have, that it has under the direct control of the Ministry of Home Affairs, right? And not under the Ministry of Defense. You have, um, you know, the CRPF, the CISF, the Assam Rifles. I think now that is going to change, though. Oh, no, sorry, it is going to merge with the ITBP, if I'm not mistaken, uh, like the ITBP itself, the Sashastar Sima Bal. There are seven central armed police forces. And perhaps if we can sort of discuss how the two work together. Um, where do the lines exist, where they are blurred, and you know how do they play a role in what the army does, and also as a kind of check maybe to the army's role in a lot of things. So maybe I should answer the second point okay, first, sure. right? Which is uh, which is a point which I think Stephen Wilkinson makes yeah, uh, yeah. in his book, which is a very important book. I mm-hmm. encourage all readers to read, you know, mm-hmm. take a look at it. Uh, Stephen makes this uh, very important point that you know there is a. Uh, uh, move the drive towards creating the paramilitary forces obviously you know by various other reasons which is that the army is overextended etc mm. uh, however also has the consequence mm. if not the intent at least the consequence of creating alternative sort of you know balances of power within the sort of domestic constituency right so so in a sense you do not uh, have the armed forces as the sole authority which wields legitimate use of force in the barbarian sense right mm. I mean so the state has kind of parceled out who are the entities which can deal with it. And in, in some ways, you know, that, that I, I think that the argument is quite convincing about mm. the consequences. I'm not so sure whether that was the motivating okay. reason behind it. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but but uh, I think it, it varies from place to place and, you know, it varies from sort of organization to organization. Mm. For instance, the BSF mm. was uh, created after the 1965 war, primarily because of the kind of, you know, the, the war began over a skirmish on the border. And, you know, if you sort of put the army to do everything, then it becomes very difficult for them to then focus on their main job, which is to fight the main battle, right? I mean, so so that, so there are differences in the way that some of these things came about. But the consequence, I, I would say, is nevertheless to create a certain balance of power within the domestic political system. Now, the paramilitaries and the armed forces themselves have reasonably distinctly defined roles, right? Uh, so as you said, many of the paramilitaries are there for what you might think of as somewhat more static roles, right? Whether it is kind of defending certain parts of the border being this thing or of certain installations as in CISF. Hmm. So uh, their role, if I have to sort of think about it in military terms, what I'd say is that, you know, maybe the best way of thinking about it is that they do not have as much of a mobile operational role as the armed forces have, uh, as the army has. And uh, of course, they they play a very important role, but, uh, you know, their kind of um, remit is somewhat restricted. Like, for instance, even in terms of, you know, if, if there is, say, a anticipation that there is going to be a war, the Indian Army is in technically supposed to take over all the border posts which are manned by the BSF, right? So, uh, for instance, that happened during the Kargil War. I mean, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I mean so um, the, the Army was also sent in to beef up the border posts which are man- manned by the BSF. So, so, they do coordinate. And in the context of many internal security insurgencies, usually you have structures like unified commands, 
because you have to bring in various entities right it's not just the armed forces it is also the civilian administration the political civilian state political uh, authorities you have the uh, state police and then you have the paramilitaries right so so you try and create these kinds of structures and uh, there's a scholar called sanjeev barua who has looked at some of this work in the context of the northeast of india and he says that you know one of the reasons why so many uh, of the governors of northeastern states which had insurgencies were military people was precisely to enable this kind of a structure to mm. come which i think is again uh, quite an important point uh, which is being made so yeah so they do have some differentiation of things but they typically try and work within some kind of a structure where people understand what their respective roles are so on that context so we can then i suppose move into the present context and in the last few years there's been a sense that the armed forces are being politicized and we were just having this conversation before we started this podcast and you mentioned that pa- perhaps the start of this was the one rank one pension um, issue which sort of became something like a mass agitation among uh, veterans uh, maybe you can explore that a little bit in terms of why do you think that this was the start of the process of some sort of politicization of the armed forces yeah so when we're talking about politicization right i mean mm. it it isn't like okay here is a point beyond it is politics okay right? yeah. so so let's let's say that you know the boundaries of what we consider to be politics or political actions mm. are not my judgment might differ from those of other people Fair right enough. but the reason i was uh, you know i think of the one rank one pension agitation which was actually you know motivated by a fairly long standing demand mm. which had you know they had tried to give effect through to various governments you know it, it is not as if the armed forces and or the veterans who are ex- effectively the ex servicemen um, you know who who led the agitation demanded this uh, but but by the turn of you know 2011 12 you had a sense that you know the ex servicemen community was taking a view that we needed to have some kind of pressure group politics around this particular issue mm-hmm. which i think was an important turning point mm-hmm. now because you know when you decide to act as a pressure group then you have to say that listen who should i bring that pressure to bear on obviously it is the government of the day mm-hmm. but in order to make that pressure effective which are the other sort of you know political sort of actors and communities that we need to be able to mobilize on our behalf in order to be able to do this now conversely that also opens up the space of oppositional politics itself mm. to for these kinds of issues to come into play in an uh, in a much more political way so for instance if you think of uh, the bharatiya janata party's uh, you know campaign ahead of the 2014 election i think the one rank one pension issue was front and center there mm. in fact when uh, narendra modi became the prime ministerial candidate of the bjp one of the first rallies that he held was with a very large group of ex servicemen in rewadi mm-hmm. and uh, you know subsequently they uh, they gave a ticket to retired general v k singh who was a former chief of the army staff uh, not to say that former chiefs should not politics mm-hmm. but in that case it was an important one because um, general v k singh was uh, someone who had a very controversial tenure mm-hmm. uh, with the previous government he had taken that government to the supreme court and post retirement he was co-opted by the bjp uh, to say that listen we are much more stronger on national security issues and so on so I- in a sense i see that as a starting point of this and just to say that you know this is not about a congress versus bjp kind of story right because what happened to the one rank one pension agitation even after the declaration of the award yeah. was that some people still continue to agitate yeah and that there was a division within the ex servicemen community now now ex servicemen are you know linked to the serving sort of personnel in 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 fairly important ways there are structures uh, not just of you know effective structures of you know uh, you know that you have people who serve together but actual communities which come from similar places as, as i told you as you yeah indicated in yeah, terms right. of the recruitment process yeah exactly yeah. right so so at, at so many levels what happens to ex servicemen and their demands resonates with people in the armed forces right mm. so that i think makes all uh, this now if you sort of add the more kind of recent development of mobile phone technology uh things like whatsapp social media access even to serving personnel which believe me is a relatively new thing i mean if i can just digress for a minute you know when i was serving in the indian army which is not all that long ago uh, say between the period from 2001 to 3 i was in two different locations once in sikkim once in jnk hmm. in neither place was there any cell phone network not even in the main cities right like shrinagar gangtok did not have it hmm. forget anything else uh there's like if you you might have one internet kiosk somewhere very very far away 
and uh, you know there was just no access to those kinds of things um, but today you're in a very very different situation you know everyone has access to mobile phones they have access to networks so they are uh, you know the what is happening in the outside world you know impacts on serving personnel in a much more direct immediate way hmm. and serving personnel have also sort of used some of those right we saw those videos used by some bsf person a couple yes. of years ago Absolutely, yes yeah. yes yeah and there's also the sort 24 by 7 nature of social media that allows sort of no boundaries to be drawn and the imagination that there should be uh, and the difficulty of tracking where exactly it ends is pretty much uh, very yeah. hard to do and now it's become harder i suppose to cut yourself off fully from what is going on and to sort of not have any input or any take or any idea of how it affects you and i suppose the key difficulty is how do we not let this affect the institution and i think that is sort of i i wonder if like um, say the armed forces are grappling with this how do we ensure that sure individual soldiers may be free to have opinions or whatever but how do we ensure this is not affect I mean, how does not affect the way the institution one functions and to the institution is perceived because a lot of really uh, what makes institutions institutions is the perception that they function in a certain way the perception that you can get expect something from and that's them. a similar question that's been raised in the context of the judiciary how exactly. do you separate your personal and who you are and what you see and learn yeah. uh, from how you decide the cases that are before you yeah So again two parts to this question right mm. so the first one about saying are the armed forces uh, aware uh, seized of this particular problem and this challenge i think they are okay in fact there were some news reports i cannot vouch for them but mm. uh, which suggested that the army has asked particularly all officers and serving personnel to sort of withdraw from whatsapp groups but as you can imagine it's almost impossible to enforce yeah. these things you yeah. know people uh, continue to remain on um, those kinds of things now back in the day you know uh, the in in the pre sort of connected era so to speak the way that you would enforce these kinds of things is by making sure that you know issues of broader politics and what's happening etc are not issues of public discussion within units mm-hmm. and even officers right i mean so so you know the, the classic sort of injunction which i still remember you know you get do's and don'ts as a young officer and back in the day you know used to be that you know you can't discuss two things in an officer's mess one is politics other is women right i mean so <laughs> so those were the days i mean and, and uh, you know uh, and um, but but i think all of those is going to become much more difficult and the armed forces have to evolve you can't just wind the clock back and now say listen hmm. let's go back right which is where i think the second part of your observation becomes even more important hmm. because see when we say that how is the institution perceived let's face it the institution and its perception is based on the people who are at the helm of affairs hmm. it is not your ordinary jawan except in the case that you know someone circulates some video you know yeah. about something that their actions are impacting uh, in terms of the institutional perception in a direct way it is more about how the senior sort of officers of the armed forces uh, are able to do it right and w- when you have uh, you know say uh, a former army chief who's had a recent and somewhat controversial tenure going and joining another party getting a ticket becoming a minister does it send out a good message in my, in my reading not because it then creates incentives for people to think that you know maybe there are other things to hope for than just governorships of northeastern states yeah <laughs> right i mean incentives are created and we see that with bureaucracy right i mean there's so much of criticism of bureaucracy saying that senior bureaucrats get all these kinds of jobs in regulatory sort of positions and you know which which creates all kinds of perverse incentives yeah. Yeah. No. now this is not a comment on any individual but mm. about what kinds of um, you know uh, incentives are created mm. and i think that becomes quite important yeah it's the seepage of the idea of patronage in some ways into um into the army and and its structure right yeah and again the armed forces have had in the past you know created certain ways of dealing with these things which i should say have always had mixed sort of consequences say one of the things which again was in the news about 2 or 3 years ago when the current army chief general bipin rawat was appointed was that he superseded another officer and he was made it right yeah. now supersession in the armed forces is generally not uh, you know something which is followed simply because it then creates an opportunity for junior officers to lobby with politicians and so so you don't want to ever create those kinds of incentives but again you know i think that is not you know seniority principle has not always given us the best results so we have to concede that and, and it's a government's political prerogative so i actually do not kind of think that you know we can say to the government that listen you should not should do that yeah. but at the same time i think 
as with every institution, but more so with the armed forces, I think the government should realize that, listen, the consequences of tampering with certain kinds of institutional practices and uh, thing could have much longer term consequences and damages uh, can be done. Because once you make certain norms kind of, you know, as things which you can sort of set aside or, you know, create new sorts of practices, then I think we will be in a very different kind of a position from where we are. And I, I guess that sort of leaves us in a slightly tricky position um, in the sense that, yes, we can see, I mean, one of the things that I should have added when we had this discussion was that the result of, say, having a cabinet minister and, uh, you know, separate chiefs of staff is that the cabinet minister, the, the defense minister is the one who sits in the cabinet. He's the one who sits in in that position and takes a decision. Um, and if, if, for instance, we had followed the original British system, the defense minister and the chiefs of staff would have all sat in the cabinet. They would have all been part of essential civil uh, civilian decision making. But I wonder how that might change if we do eventually, and as they have decided to do so, if we get a chief of arms. Is there a sense that this might lead to the kind of pressure going, no, look, you know, we should have uh, someone, for, like since there is now one person as opposed to trying to pick one of the three uh, who is going to be the chief of all arms staff, should we not just have that person in the cabinet and, you know, cut out a couple of uh, people in the middle in the decision making. I wonder if that might lead to this kind of uh, pressure to more formally integrate the army into the decision making process. I think it's useful to just rehearse the reasons why hmm. this particular suggestion of creating a hmm. chief of defense staff as a single point military advisor to the defense minister has actually taken so long to be implemented. Okay. And I think part of the reason for that is simply the desire on the part of the political leadership to make sure that the military leadership is not concentrated. You know, you, it's, mm-hmm. it's again, back in the day, there was this concern that you don't want to empower the military too much and, and so on, right? Mm-hmm. But this is an issue which has been discussed oh, at least over the last 20 years, if not more. Successive sort of reports coming out after Cargill and various other committees have recommended that we should have this structure because... That is the only way of ensuring that we are able to integrate the armed forces themselves and have that kind of what we call in that jargon jointness mm. uh, to be a more effective fighting force in the 21st century, right? So, so there are functional imperatives and not having that kind of, uh, you, know, f- you know, integration has had actually serious consequences. I think the problem of vertical integration, mm. which is between the armed forces and the Ministry of Defense not being there has also had serious consequences. Mm. It has led to a huge culture of mistrust between the serving uniformed military personnel and the bureaucracy particularly, right? Because the way the, uh, you know, the, the seniors or particularly retired military officers will uh, explain it to say that, you know, listen, we are okay for civilian control of the armed forces. We are not okay with the civil services control of the armed forces. Uh, <laughs> right? yes. Why is yes, political yes. control becoming bureaucratic control? Yes. Yeah, so, so again, those are pathologies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think I am personally in favor of a empowered chief of defense staff mm-hmm. kind of an entity being created. Mm-hmm. With a clear this thing that, you know, the chief of defense staff reports to the Raksha Mantri and there is a defense secretary who looks after the secretariat right. that we have cross posting, not just of military officers to the Ministry of Defense, but also civilian officers, say, to the headquarters of the armed forces, mm. because you need to get that kind of trust in the system going, mm. which sadly at this point of time is at, uh, at, at something of a deficit. Mm. So, uh, therefore, I think it's important that, you know, th- this uh, be done. Mm. Uh, I think the challenges in terms of saying that listen is it going to empower the military i think are uh, far fewer okay. than the downsides of actually not having a properly empowered uh, in an integrated sort of armed forces set up today mm-hmm. i think that's more important and that's what we should be pushing for okay I'd like to touch upon a parallel but uh, related thing that you brought up earlier, which is, uh, you know, the role of social media and how it's playing into um, into expectations around nationalism or uh, how, you know, even the idea that the army is being politicized. What has happened much more recently um, is that the army has been elevated as a symbol of national pride, as uh, it's used as rhetoric, it's used as uh, symbolism uh, in very many contexts, whether it's demonetization and, you know, the idea of soldiers standing, but you can't stand in line kind of thing. So, you know, that has a, a that that is a, a curious kind of occurrence of contemporary times. Uh, but, uh, you know, what are the underpinnings of that? And, you know, how does it also unravel in some senses? No, I think you're right. Uh Particularly over the last five, six years, there has been a fairly concerted drive to present the armed forces as somehow the greatest symbol of the kind of nationalism that, you know, the ruling party stands for. 
and there is clearly an attempt at uh, appropriation of that uh, it's happened in many different ways again not all of which are necessarily questionable right um, but clearly they do seem to fit into some kind of a pattern of appropriation if i may put it that way hmm. uh, just to you know pick out a few landmarks for you right uh, so for instance in 2015 there was this kind of 50th anniversary of the 1965 war which was organized as a sort of a big event right and, and 1965 war is not a war where we can claim any great victory so to speak but yeah. the war was kind of repackaged in fact the uh, if you read the official history of the 1965 war which was commissioned by the ministry of defense many years ago it actually is is pretty sort of critical of the indian conduct of the war but the celebratory histories which were commissioned uh, in on the 50th anniversary try to overturn that word yeah. and um, you know so so that was uh, an important thing you know there was all this carnival i remember about uh, various kinds of things then there has been this uh, you know post the surgical strike you know the uri and and mm-hmm. of course you know the, not to forget the great contribution of another institution which i hope you will cover which is the indian film industry yes. <laughs> indian politics yeah. um, you know the, this kind of you know constant drive towards saying we need these great stories to come out uh, and so on or even how a phrase like surgical strikes has kind of seeped into common parlance partly through the kind of yes. vectors mm-hmm. that you're talking about right mm-hmm. demonetization is a surgical strike or something else yes. right i mean yeah. so um so there are those things uh, and then of course you know uh, the balakot uh, mm. strike itself and and the way that it has been um, you know uh, sort of used uh, in 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 election campaign so so i think it is fair to say that there is clearly a uh, concerted attempt and it is in this context that i feel it is even more important for the people who are the sort of front facing entities of the institution the leaders of the institution really to uh, suggest that listen whatever might be broader public perceptions of us as guardians of indian nationalism or whatever it is we consider ourselves to be a professional fighting force that is our identity we neither want more nor aspire for more mm-hmm. finally and we're almost coming to the close of uh, our time finally the one issue which i think also is partly somewhere between the politics and i think is the money and the money when i say is not just about how much is allocated to the armed forces but how it's spent and uh, we've the, the one way to look at it is of course all the scams which governments seem to keep getting stuck on which i think is a feature of something that you just described which is controlled by civil services as opposed to civil in control but i wonder if at some point there will have to be a hard political decision taken on this front which is which is going to have fairly grave implications to say that the indian army is just too big right in terms of the number of uh, men it has and we need a much more leaner fighting force so we keep hearing this over and over again at least since cargill from what i remember but i wonder if what we have just discussed so far about glorifying the army and all of that makes a tough decision like that unpalatable to say that maybe spending so much on individuals and then having to pay pensions and all of that may not be the best way to use the limited resources that the army can have because the increasing the pool is not so much of an option in a country with this many disparities this much uh, need for social welfare but maybe we need to be more sensible to say that we need perhaps leaner more efficient strike core we probably uh, need a much smaller in terms of personnel and nothing uh, and without reducing the abilities uh, we need a much leaner army and therefore to cut the size of the army i mean a very large way i wonder if this makes a decision like that much more difficult from the political perspective yeah i think everyone would concede the broad argument that you're making mm. which is to say that uh, you know we are there is a clear sort of limit to how much defense spending can be in india yeah you know we've never sort of breached say 3% of gdp yeah. for uh, defense allocation it's always been on the lower bound mm. um you know if the pie is growing strong enough then it's kind of good but if you are in an economic situation like what we are currently clearly it's not that much yeah. the current economic slowdown coincides with you know at least for now diminished tax collection capacity of the yes. government revenues yes. are sort of drying up this is the same time that you committed to these extraordinary pension schemes yeah you know uh, which which will in 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 longer run this thing and already you must remember the armed forces uh you know all the other government of india services moved to a very different kind of a pension scheme yes. i think in the year 2003 yeah. but the armed forces still remain on the older pension thing and i think that's fair enough they they do make sort of uh, you know uh, their their role and uh, responsibilities are very different mm. but the f- there is a fiscal sort of you know cliff that is there mm. which which we all have to sort of admit and i think the problem is that if this impacts military modernization because if if you have most of your budget going towards 
revenue expenditure mm. and you don't have that much on capital mm. then you're not going to modernize that fast yeah. right so it's yeah. it, so i think these arguments are made and in fact um, along with a colleague of mine suyash rai you know i've been sort of trying to put some uh, hard numbers onto uh, this stuff and I, and i think what the projections are pretty clear which is that going forward some of these things will become uh, a, a drag on military modernization I, everyone recognizes it the question is who is going to bell the cat right. and at what timing can you sequence this right i mean uh, so it's not like you can just downsize the armed forces drastically yes. Yes. Uh, at a time when employment is already such a big issue first that is there so what you can do is that you can only over a period of time say that listen we will look to reconfigure the armed forces hmm. yeah i was also wondering if some of this is located in the context of you know it being 2019 which is that battle lines are not just drawn in the physical sort of sense but also very much in the domain of the internet and uh you know issues of security that arises in the context of that uh, and how much of this sort of is the domain of the armed forces as we traditionally imagine it versus the civilian government and what it does and needs to do uh in in the in in, in these domains which are sort of newer i guess yeah i mean so those domains are there there is uh, cyber warfare uh, you know all the digital kind of domain challenges uh, are recognized but we should also remember that you know india as a country kind of faces somewhat old fashioned hmm. military security challenges you have disputed borders on uh, with pakistan and with china right now that automatically means that you know even if you want to hold that territory and this thing you know you have to sort of have a lot more manpower than other armies might require so in a sense this cannot be an exercise just about saying oh the nature of warfare in the 21st century is changing fair right. enough yes. but as far as india is concerned you know we may still be in the 20th century in terms of the kind of immediate problems that we face but yes at the same time we have to think about saying how do we get military modernization if you're going to have such you know be so personal heavy uh, as an armed force also we need to ask ourselves some kinds of tougher questions which i don't think the armed forces are asking for instance uh, you know this is a kind of a question that i've always been quite interested in over many years now it's been 20 years since india and pakistan went nuclear mm. right now everyone understands that there are strict limits within which the use of force can happen right i mean so we we applaud something like a balakot strike because it goes beyond just doing things along the border right i mean so you push the boundary a little bit but you're still careful you calibrate actions you do not want escalation there are all those kinds of things which uh, we have seen but we still have structures like you know the arm and the army has you know three very large strike corps which are these tank armored mechanized formations you know which which are there for classic sort of deep penetration into the enemy territory capture holding of territory now i just wonder you know who imagines that we can actually do those yes. kinds of operations in that context right so some hard thinking will have to be done yeah. and that is yeah. where i think actually having a cds might help okay mm. because mm. a cds might actually have the time and the authority mm. to catalyze some of those conversations which i think between the services they themselves are not because see today the service chiefs are also responsible for raising equipping training and commanding the force the co- army chief is also the commander of the entire indian army mm. in practical terms right so it's it's a there are too many things on their plate so i think having a cds who can take a much more broader view because these kinds of questions are also so closely related with the policy realm right because what constitutes a red line as far as you know threshold for nuclear action from pakistan what is our assessment mm-hmm. those are all issues which cannot just be left to the armed forces so right. it's a broader conversation and uh, it's my hope that the cds will actually be able to catalyze those conversations yeah i guess uh, on that note we will have to close this episode uh, thank you so much shrinath this was a very interesting conversation uh, i think we have a lot of take away from this and i'm sure our listeners also uh, would have really enjoyed this conversation thank you so much for joining us once again on the podcast thank you see you next wednesday see you next wednesday thank you all tune in for more episodes Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you enjoy listening to content on the IVM Podcast Network, let me tell you about a couple of things that you should check out this week. On the Empowering series, Zarina is joined by Ambar Qureshi, founder of the Plum Tree and former plus size model. They talk about body positivity, self belief, and the idea behind starting her own clothing venture. On 9XM Soundcast, Eva is in conversation with Bollywood singer Palak Muchal. She has lent her voice to movies like MS Dhoni, Aashiqui 2, and Prem Ratan Dhan Payo. On the Habit Coach, Ashton talks about voting and acknowledging the choices that we make with a mindful approach. On Pragati Podcast, we have repeat guest Omaya Nayak who talks to Pawan about refugees, distress, migrants and movement of people across the world. On Ganatantra this week, Alok and Sarira are joined by Dr. Srinath Raghavan to discuss politics of the armed forces, nationalism, the impact of social media on perceptions of the army and more. 
on Mr. and Mrs. Binge Watch. Janice and Anirudh will talk about the highly rated show this year, Succession. Thanks, and we hope to see you again soon. The modern world is obsessed with food and agriculture. Everywhere you look, new and exciting technologies are bringing food innovation to your street market, your grocery store, your doorstep, and your plate. From our quest for the perfect food photos to our rediscovery of ancient grains, quite simply, food has never been sexier. But guess what? The modern food system is broken. It's a major cause of climate change, antibiotic resistance, and global poverty. So how did we get here, and where are we going? Most importantly, how are we going to feed 10 billion people globally by the year 2050 through better, more sustainable means? I'm Varun Deshpande, and I'm Ramya Ramurthy, and we work for the Good Food Institute, a global non-profit accelerating the transformation to a more healthy, sustainable, and just food system. The next food revolution is here. On Feeding 10 Billion, we're giving you the inside view. You can tune into us every Tuesday on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts from. <laughs> 